this presentation, we are in the book of Ether, the last block of scripture. This will be Ether, chapters 12 through 15. So let's take a look at some of the doctrines and principles in Ether 12 through 15. Okay, we begin with Ether chapter 12. Chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, the phrase, the days of Ether. Ether, as the Lord's chosen prophet, was untiring in his ministry and exhorting his people to repent in order to avert destruction. He was so filled with the Spirit of the Lord that he could not be restrained by others or prevented by them from fulfilling his divine mandate. Being filled with the Spirit also compelled Ether, as it can upon us, to magnify his calling and not be distracted or diverted from such important work by things of lesser significance. Chapter 12, verse 3, the phrase, By faith all things are fulfilled. Ether's message to his people was that they should believe in God unto repentance. It is by faith in Christ and his atoning sacrifice that repentance is made possible. True repentance is based on the, based on and flows from faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, declared President Ezra Taft Benson. There is no other way. It is by faith that all things relating to the plan of salvation come to fruition in the hearts and lives of the children of God. The work and the glory of God is fulfilled by faith. Remember, faith is doing what God wants, when he wants it, and how he wants it done. Chapter 12, verse 4, the phrase, Hope for a Better World. From the context of my other Book of Mormon discourses on hope, it is clear that Ether and Moroni are referring to the hope of a glorious resurrection, an eternal life that comes to all who press forward with a perfect brightness of hope, and who in faith repent of their sins, are faithful to the commandments of the gospel, and who endure to the end. This hope for a better world is not, however, totally unrelated to the mortal world. Hoping for a better world should not be viewed as passively putting up with the problems and pains of this life, being fixated only on the next life. It implies living in such a way that our hope for a better world can be, to some degree, realized in this life. Hope like faith implies action. Hope for a better world will, of necessity, motivate us to love our fellow man and to seek to eliminate, where possible, the suffering of our brothers and sisters around us. Hope will lead us to greater compassion and more, f mercifully, de and more mercifully dealings with those around us. In this particular way, we can hope for a better world here and now. Having hope in Christ and his resurrection and for a better world is what helps us get through the challenges and sufferings. If I have a hope in Christ, then I can face my afflictions and infirmities with faith in Christ. Chapter 12, verse 4, the phrase, Which hope cometh of faith, making an anchor to the souls of men. Hope that saves is born of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and leads one to its hungry and thirsting after righteousness. Hope is not merely wishful thinking, fantasizing, or emotional escapism. It is a moving confidence and a firm expectation of eternal life that comes trusting in the Savior. Did you catch that? It's a firm expectation. In other words, you know the path you're on will lead to eternal life. That is hope. The hope that is an anchor to the souls of men is riveted to the infinite and eternal sacrifice of the Lord. It is by reason of the atonement that we have hope for a better world. Hope in Christ that flows from faith is an abiding confidence in the fulfillment of God's promises and covenants to us. It is an inner peace that results from our personal relationship with deity. This active hope in Christ makes one sure and steadfast, always abounding in good works, being led to glorify God. From the Book of Mormon usage of the concept of hope, it appears that hope is linked to the change of heart that comes with faith unto repentance. Faith leads one to desire righteousness, which in turn leads to repentance and a change of heart, which brings hope. Such hope leads one to continue to abound in righteousness and to a yearning for eternal association with the pure in heart and those whose garments have been made white by the blood of the Lamb. Elder John H. Grober declared, quote, the basis of all those, the basis of the righteous, 
The basis of all righteous hope is the person of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In him, all hope has its existence. Without him, there is no hope. Because he was and is and ever will be, there was, is, and ever will be hope. In Christ, who lives and loves and works miracles, now there is always hope. Hope is not this wishful thing. Oh, I hope it happens. No, hope is an assurance in the Lord Jesus Christ that he can save us, that there is exaltation in his kingdom. And you have that knowledge born to your soul. And that gives you hope that there is a better life and a better way. Chapter 12, verses 5 through 6, because they saw them not. Many of Ether's great prophecies and testimonies were rejected by the spiritual blind Jaredites. Moroni informs us that their disbelief was because they saw them not. This is an age-old rejection of the spiritual workings of God. The world states that seeing is believing. Such logic, however, defies the workings of God and denies the words of the prophets. Faithless antichrists like Korhor and others always insisted on visual proof as a preface to and a condition for faith. The scriptures, however, repeatedly teach that seeing is not only unessential to faith, but in some respects is also irrelevant to the acquisition of faith and hope. The Savior testified that those who believe without seeing are more blessed than those who require tangible evidence in order to believe. Moroni's urging us to dispute not because you see not is not a reprimand, but an invitation to acquire greater faith. To those who have true faith, there is no reason to murmur or dispute, because they realize that faith, faith that is not dependent on moral sight, mortal sight, opens the spiritual eyes to greater views of the things of God. This kind of spiritual scene inevitably leads one to greater faith and hope, the fulfilling of one's life with charity and the life that abounds in good works and service to others. Chapter 12, verse 6. Ye receive no witness until after the trial of your faith. To have our spiritual eyes open through faith necessitates a trial of our faith. Believing without seeing will result in greater seeing. This opening of our spiritual eyes is not granted by God to us without effort on our part. It comes only as we are willing to exercise our faith and trust in the Lord when the path we must pursue is not completely illuminated. Regarding his return to the city of Jerusalem on a dangerous mission to procure the sacred brass plates that were in the possession of Laban, Nephi said, And I was led by the Spirit, not knowing beforehand what I should do. Nephi's witness, seeing the mission fulfilled in a miraculous and unexpected way, came only after a trial of his faith. The way was open for him to do what the Lord commanded him, but only after he was willing to walk by faith, not by sight. This concept is further illustrated in the following experience of Elder Boyd K. Packer. Quote, Some years ago I learned a lesson that I shall never forget. I had been called on assignment to the Council of the Twelve, and we were to move to Salt Lake City and find an adequate and permanent home. President Henry D. Moyle assigned someone to help us. A home was located that was ideally suited to our needs. Elder Harold B. Lee came and looked it over very carefully and then counseled, By all means, you are to proceed. But there was no way we could proceed. I had just completed the coursework on a doctor's degree and was writing the dissertation. With the support of my wife and our eight children, all of the resources we could gather over the years had been spent. Had been spent. Who? Oh, let's see. Had been spent. I just a type of forgot to fix the screen on this. Has been spent on education, by borrowing on our insurance, gathering every resource we could barely get into the house, and without sufficient left even to make the first monthly payment. Brother Lee insisted, "Go ahead. I know it is right." I was in deep turmoil because I had been counseled to do something I had never done before, to sign a contract without having the resources to meet the payments. When Brother Lee sensed my feelings, he sent me to President David O. McKay, who listened very carefully. As I explained the circumstance, he said, You do this. It is the right thing. 
but he extended no resources to make the doing of it possible. When I reported to Brother Lee, he said, that confirms what I have told you. I was still not at peace, and then came the lesson. Elder Lee said, do you know what is wrong with you? You always want to see the end from the beginning. I replied quietly that I wanted to see at least a few steps ahead. He answered by quoting from the sixth verse of the twelfth chapter of Ether. Wherefore, dispute not because you see not, for you receive no witness until after the trial of your faith. And then he asked, my boy, you must learn to walk to the edge of the light and perhaps a few steps into the darkness. And you will find that the light will appear and move ahead of you. And so it was, but only as we walked to the edge of the light. End of quote. Trials of faith do not always come in the form of adversity. And the rich G. Scott of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught that sometimes, quote, the trial of our faith is simply a matter of exercising our faith. You can learn to use faith more effectively by applying this principle taught by Moroni. Faith is things which are hoped for and not seen. Wherefore dispute not, because you see not, for you have received no witness until after the trial of your faith. Thus, every time you try your faith, that is, act in worthiness on an impression, you will receive the confirming evidence of the Spirit. Those feelings will fortify your faith. As you re repeat that pattern, your faith will become stronger. End of quote. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles wrote of the various levels of faith we experience and the prerequisites of the expressions of them. Preparatory faith is formed by experiences in the past, by the known, which provides a basis for belief. But redemptive faith, which oft, must often be exercised towards experiences in the future, the unknown, which provides an opportunity for the miraculous. Extracting faith, moving mountains, exacting faith, moving mountain faith, faith like the brother of the like that of the brother of Jared, precedes the miracle and the knowledge. He had to believe before God spoke. He had to act before the ability to complete the action was apparent. He had to come to the complete experience in advance of even the first segment of its realization. Faith is to agree unconditionally and in advance to whatever conditions God may require in both the near and distant futures. President Gordon B. Hinckley illustrated this principle of receiving our witness after the trial of our faith. He said, let me give you a story of a woman in Sao Paulo, Brazil. She worked while going to school to provide for her family. I used, to, I, used her own, I used her own words in telling the story. She says, quote, the university in which I studied had a regulation that prohibited the students that were in debt from taking tests. For this reason, when I received my salary, I would first separate the money for tithing and offerings, and the remainder was allotted for the payment of the school and other experiences. I remember a time when I faced serious financial difficulties. It was a Thursday when I received my salary. When I figured the monthly budget, I noticed that there wouldn't be enough to pay both my tithing and my university. I would have to choose between them. The, my, the bi-monthly tests would start the following week, and if I didn't take them, I could lose the school year. I felt great agony. My heart ached. I had a painful decision before me, and I didn't know what to decide. I pondered between the two choices, to pay tithing or to risk the possibility of not obtaining the necessary credits to be approved in school. This feeling consumed my soul and remained with me up to Saturday. It was then that I remembered that when I was baptized, I agreed to live the law of tithing. I had taken upon myself an obligation, not with the missionaries, but with my Heavenly Father. At that moment, the anguish started to disappear, giving place to pleasant sensation of tranquility and determination. That night when I prayed, I asked the Lord to forgive me for my indecision. On Sunday, before the beginning of the sacrament meeting, I contacted the bishop, and with great pleasure I paid my tithing and offerings. That was a special day. I felt happy and peaceful within myself and with Heavenly Father. The next day I was in my office. I tried to find a way to be able to take the test that would begin on Wednesday. The more I thought, the further I felt for a solution. 
The working period was ending when my employer approached and gave the last orders of the day. When he had done so, with his briefcase in his hand, he bid farewell. Suddenly he halted and looked at me, say, asked, How was your college? I was surprised. I couldn't believe I was what I was hearing. The only thing I could answer was a trembling voice. Everything is all right. He looked thoughtful at me and bid farewell again. Suddenly the secretary entered the room saying that I was a very fortunate person. When I asked her why, she simply answered, the employer has just said that from today on the company is going to pay fully for your college and your books. Before you leave, stop at my desk and inform me of the cost so that tomorrow I can give you a check. After she left, crying and feeling very humble, I knelt exactly where I was and thanked the Lord for his generosity. I said to Heavenly Father that he didn't have to bless me so much. I only needed the cost of one month's installment, and the tithing I had paid on Sunday was a very small compared to the amount I was receiving. During that prayer, the words recorded in Malachi came to my mind. Prove me now, herewith saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open your windows of heaven and pour into you out of blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Up to that moment, I had never felt the magnitude of the promise contained in that scripture, and that this commandment was truly a witness of the love that God, our Heavenly Father, gives to his children here on earth. There is truly a sister who acted in faith, doing what God wanted, when he wanted, how he wanted it done, not knowing the consequences of what would happen, just trusting in God. And God took care of her. Let's see if I can get back on track now. Uh, I've got this uh, um, chapter 12 verse 6 receive no witness until after the trial of your faith to have our spiritual eyes open through faith necessitates a trial of our faith believing without seeing will result in greater seeing oh we, we did that one I'm sorry Oh, here's the thing I just read. I had put it on. I've got it mixed up. Let's get past this. Chapter 12, verses 7 through 12. For it was by faith that Christ showed himself unto our fathers. Faith precedes miracles, whatever their nature or manifestation. Moroni illustrates this doctrine with several scriptural examples of prophets and others who have gone before him, who were recipients of great miracles, testimonies, and blessings of the Lord as a result of their great faith. These role models of faith and beneficiaries of such marvelous faith preceded miracles cited by Moroni, including Alma and Amulek, Nephi and Lehi, Ammon, the great biblical prophets and apostles whose faith produced mighty miracles the three Nephites, and the brother of Jared, whose faith pierced the veil of eternity. The last example Moroni used to illustrate the power of faith has direct application to the very work in which he is engaged. The abridgment, preparation, and preservation of the records in order that they may come forth in the last days to fulfill their intended purposes. It is by faith that all those who perceive Moroni, men who had pleaded with the Father in faith that these records be preserved, that the Book of Mormon has come forth in this dispensation for the convincing of Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ. By using each of these examples, Moroni is teaching us that no miracle, whatever kind or in whatever manner, is possible without the exercise of faith. Miracles without number have been wrought by faith by the prophets and saints of all dispensations. Elder Bruce R. McConkie wrote, And always faith precedes the miracle. Always the power of faith performs the miracles. Always the miracle proves that faith was present and in active operation. Chapter 12, verse 8, That others might 
be partakers of the heavenly gift. The heavenly gift of which Moroni speaks of is the forgiveness of sins, the companionship of the Holy Ghost, and the accompanying gifts of the Spirit that are bestowed upon the just and faithful saints of God. The Apostle Peter spoke of this gift as the divine nature, see 2 Peter 1.4, that through the atoning grace of Christ swallowed up the natural man. Through faith and acceptance of Christ's atoning plan of mercy, people can be cleansed of iniquity, transformed into new creatures. During the golden era of the Nephite society, Zion society, the people partook of the heavenly gift, produced a society free of from contention and disputation, injustices and inequalities, lasciviousness and crime. By virtue of this transformation that resulted from their faith in Christ, it was said of them, and there could not be a happier people among all the people who have been created by the hand of God. Chapter 12, verse 11, A More Excellent Way The more excellent way of life is to be found only in Christ. Believing in Him, loving, praising, and worshiping Him, and following Him by obedience to His commandments, He is the way, the only by the, and only by living His life can we experience the abundant life the more excellent way of life, he promised. The Apostle Paul used the same phrase to speak of charity, the pure love of Christ. And of course, the greatest manifestation of the love of God is the gift of his Holy Son. Chapter 12, verses 23 through 26, the Gentiles will mock at these things because of our weakness in writing. Moroni, like many of his prophets, of his prophet fathers who preceded him, feared that the words he recorded in the Nephite record would be ridiculed and or rejected by later readers because of their weakness in writing. We can only speculate as to why these prophets felt that their writing was awkward and weak. Moroni, like those before him, had earnestly prayed that the Lord would, through great power of his spirit, compensate for their weakness in writing. In response to Moroni's prayer for concerns, the Lord assured him that the unbelieving, mocking Gentiles could not gain advantage over the meek and humble followers of the Nephite record. Even though the Book of Mormon was written and abridged by mortal men who had mortal frailties and weaknesses, the power of the Spirit of God transforms this book that fools may perceive as weak, as a foolish fantasy, into an inspired volume of scripture that can and does convince you and Gentile that Jesus is indeed the Christ. Although fools mock the Book of Mormon, as the word of God, it has a more powerful effect upon the minds of the people than the sword or anything else. And in this way, the Lord's promise to Moroni is fulfilled as the Nephite record continues to testify of Christ and lead men and women to the fountain of all righteousness. Chapter 12, verse 27, I give unto men weaknesses, weakness that they may be humble. Weakness of the flesh come in many forms, but all come as a result of the fall of Adam, which introduced into the world pain and problems, sickness and sorrows, temptations and trials. Not only did the, nat did the nature of man become fallen, carnal, sensual, and devilish, but the entire world, world fell to a telestial state with all of its accompanying weakness and inherent problems. The fall introduced weakness of the flesh. Weaknesses of the flesh impose natural limitations upon all of us. Mortals are also bound by worldly weakness and limitations in strength, knowledge, and power. Recognizing these limitations in stark contrast to God's infinite wisdom and power causes one to be humble. The foolishness of God is wiser than men, declared Paul the Apostle, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. One of the purposes of the conditions created by the fall is to impel men to acknowledge their own weaknesses of the flesh and depend more on the power of God than on the arm of flesh. Hardships and afflictions and mortality are often allowed by an omniscient God in order to turn the hearts of the children of men to him. In addition to the universal weakness of the flesh that comes as a result of the fall, the Lord will at time give unto men a personalized, individual challenge that is designed to increase a person's faith in and dependency upon the Lord. 
It is in these moments of personal pain and recognition of our individual weaknesses and limitations that humility, that humbly learning upon the ample arm of Jesus produces strength, which compensates for and overcomes mortal weaknesses. The Lord's giving us weaknesses in order that we may be humble, that we may humbly look to him as our source of strength is not just a series of isolated events in a lifetime, but rather is an ongoing process. We all have individual weaknesses that we were sent down here with, that we would use them to humble our hearts and turn ourselves to the Savior to overcome those weaknesses. C.S. Lewis insightfully observed, quote, when a man turns to Christ and seems to be getting on pretty well, in a sense that some of his bad habits are now corrected, he often feels that it would now be natural if things went fairly smoothly. When troubles come along, illness, money troubles, new kinds of temptations, he is disappointed. These things, he feels, might have been necessary to rouse him and make him repentant in his bad old days, but why now? Because God is forcing him upon us. Is forcing, on, is forcing him on up to a higher level, putting him into situations where he will have to be very much braver or more patient or more loving than he ever dreamed of before. It seems to us all unnecessary, but that is because we have not yet, we have not yet the slightest notion of the tremendous thing he means to make of us. So when things go bad, God is trying to move us upward and onward. May we rise to the task and not give up and foolishly charge God and become offended at him, but to rise above our weaknesses and seek God's help in doing so. Elder Neil A. Maxwell, a corner of the Twelve Apostles, spoke of how the Lord can help us overcome our weaknesses. Quote, when we read in the scriptures of man weakness, this term includes the generic but necessary weakness inherent in the general human condition in which the flesh has such an incessant impact upon the spirit. Weakness likewise includes, however, our specific individual weaknesses, which we are expected to overcome. Life has a way of exposing these weaknesses. End of quote. Further, Elder Maxwell described how recognizing our weakness is one way that the Lord has chosen to increase our learning. Quote, when we are unduly impatient with an omniscient God's timing, we really are suggesting that we know what is best. Strange, isn't it? We who wear wristwatches seek to counsel him who oversees cosmic clocks and calendars. Because God wants us to come home after having become more like him and his son, part of this developmental process of necessity consists of showing unto us our weaknesses. Hence, if we have ultimate hope, we will be submissive because with his help, these weaknesses can even become strengths. It is not an easy thing, however, to be shown one's weaknesses, as these are regularly demonstrated by life circumstances. Nevertheless, this is part of coming unto Christ, and it is vital, if painful, part of God's plan of happiness. End of quote. The scriptures testify that Jesus Christ can save us from our inequities as well as our sins. One, most gladly, therefore, will I gather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me in 2 Corinthians 2. Let us, therefore, come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need, found in Hebrews 4. The Lord God showeth us our weaknesses, that we may know that it is by his grace that we have power to do these things, Jacob said in chapter 4. Number four, I know that I am nothing as to my strength. I am weak, therefore I will not boast of myself, but I will boast of my God. For in his strength I can do all things, Alma 26. Number five, if ye shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness and love God with all your might, mind, and strength, then is his grace sufficient for you, and that by his grace ye may be perfect in Christ, Moroni 10. Certainly, Christ can save us from our inadequacies, as those five scriptural references prove. Weakness of the flesh, whether these be trials, temptations, character flaws, or any other kind of mortal limitation, in any and of themselves do not produce strength of spirit. In this verse, the Lord clearly teaches that weaknesses are turned to strengths 
only through one's coming unto Christ in faith and humility. Then is his grace sufficient to make such transformation. It is through the atonement of Jesus Christ that the weaknesses of the flesh result, resulting from the fall are swallowed up just as that which is sown in corruption is raised in incorruption. It is not just in the next life that the weak things are made strong through Christ. The Savior's grace is sufficient even in mortality to buoy up the spirit, to strengthen and spiritually enlarge one before natural above natural abilities. Ammon recognizes when he declared, I know that I am nothing as to my strength, I am weak. Therefore, I will not boast of myself, but I will boast of my God, for in his strength I can do all things. Whatever the weakness, Christ can supply the strength to overcome it. All other earthly efforts to overcome the effectiveness of the weaknesses of the flesh, as helpful as they may be, are limited in their soul, in their soul transforming power. It is through the grace of Christ that even mortal inadequacies are compensated for or overcome while ye tarry in the flesh. Through faithful acceptance of the atonement of Jesus Christ, all losses can be ultimately restored. All suffering can cease and all iniquities and injustices in life can be rectified. The Savior desires to save us from our inadequacies as well as our sins wrote Bruce C. Hafen, inadequacies is not the same as being sinful. We have far more control over the choice to sin than we may have over our innate capacity. A sense of falling short or falling down is not only natural, but essential to the mortal experience. Still, after all we can do, the atonement can fill that which is empty, straighten our bent parts, and make strong that which is weak. Brothers and sisters, we must turn to Christ to overcome our weaknesses. It is only through and by him that we can do so. We need his grace, that power, that enabling power that will help us to overcome our mortal failings. Chapter 12, verse 28, the phrase, Faith, hope, and charity bringeth unto me the fountain of all righteousness. Christ is the embodiment, the personification of all righteousness. He is the fountain, the source, and the dispenser of all righteousness. We become righteous, pure, holy, perfect through him and by his grace. The fountain of righteousness gives us living water, even eternal life. Partaking of that gift is possible only as we have hope faith, hope, and charity in our lives. This principle leads us to him. Chapter 12, verses 33 through 34. This love which thou hast had for the children of men is charity. Charity is the pure love of Christ. This love of Christ is too direct, is too directional by nature. The pure love of Christ has for the children of men is charity, and the love which they have for the Savior that comes with faith and repentance is also charity. When we are filled with charity, we are filled with the perfect love of the Savior for us. We love him because he loved us first, testified John. Such charity in our hearts is then manifested by our pure love of Christ, by our obedience, and by our love and charity to our fellow men. Elder Marvin J. Ashton of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained what it means to have charity. Quote, charity is perhaps in many ways a misunderstood word. We often equate charity with visiting the sick, taking in casseroles to those in need, or sharing our excess with those who are less fortunate. But really, true charity is much, much more. Real charity is not something you give away. It is something that you acquire and make a part of yourself. And when the virtue of charity becomes implanted in your heart, you are never the same again. It makes the thoughts of putting others down repulsive. Perhaps the greatest charity comes when we are kind to each other, when we don't judge or categorize someone else, when we simply give each other the benefit of the doubt or remain quiet. Charity is accepting someone's differences, weaknesses, and shortcomings, having patience with someone who has let us down, or resisting the impulse to become offended when someone doesn't handle something the way we might have hoped. Charity is refusing to take advantage of another's weaknesses, weakness and being willing to forgive someone who has hurt us. Charity is expecting the best of each other. End of quote. Chapter 12, verse 38. My garments are not spotted with your blood. 
in giving this warning and testimony, Moroni is saying that he is taught and testified, preached and prophesied as he had been commanded of the Lord. He has fulfilled his responsibility, and if people reject his words, they must do so by their own agency and at their own risk. In so doing, they are left without excuse. This phrase reflects what Jacob earlier taught his people concerning his prophet's prophetic responsibility and their own accountability. Jacob said, And we did magnify our office unto the Lord, taking upon us the responsibility, answering the sins of the people upon our own heads, if we did not teach them the word of God with all diligence. Wherefore, by laboring with our might, their blood might not come upon our garments. Otherwise, their blood would come upon our garments, and we would not be found spotless at the last day. Brothers and sisters, may we do what we've been commanded to do so that we do not incur the sins of other people to come upon our garments, but that we can be free of the blood and sins of this generation can only be done by preaching the word of God. Just as Jacob and I labored diligently that their garments would not be spotted with the sins of others, we too must labor in our own callings and service to teach and testify, to be an example of the believers, and in particular to live in such a way that we are not found to be stumbling blocks to the spiritual progress of another. Neither must we be the cause of someone's disbelief or rejection of the gospel. We have an obligation as believers to warn the world and invite all to come unto Christ. If we neglect this mandate by willfully refusing to be conscientious watchmen of the Lord, then the sins of those affected by our weakness and slothfulness will be answered upon our heads. May we heed the warning. Chapter 12, verse 41, I would commend you to seek this Jesus. Moroni leaves his testimony with an urgent plea to all those who would read this record, a plea to come unto Christ. The foundational objective of the Book of Mormon is the convincing of the Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ. By commending us to seek Jesus, Moroni is urging us to come unto Christ by reading and applying the teachings of the Book of Mormon. We seek Jesus not just by being converted to him, but also by partaking of his ordinances of salvation and by living his laws and being filled with the Holy Spirit. In the ultimate sense, however, Moroni is also inviting us to seek Jesus in the way that he, Moroni, had to come to know the Master in the most significant way. If we patiently, faithfully, and distantly seek Jesus, a time will come when we will see him as Moroni did. Of this, Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, As believing saints, it is our privilege to see the Lord face to face, to talk with him as a man speaketh with his friend, to have this person attend us from time to time, and to have him manifest to us the Father. After the true saints receive and enjoy the gift of the Holy Ghost, after they know how to attune themselves to the voice of the Spirit, after they mature spiritually so that they see visions, work miracles, and entertain angels, after they make their calling and election sure and prove themselves worthy of every trust, after all this and more, it becomes their right and privilege to see the Lord and commune with Him face to face. Revelations, visions, angelic visitations, the rendering of the heavens, and appearances among the men of the Lord himself. All these things are for all of the faithful. They are not reserved for apostles and prophets only. God is no respecter of persons. They are not reserved for one age only, or for a select lineage of people. We are all of God's children. All men are welcome. End of quote. What a beautiful promise by Elder McConkie. May we live up to actually realize that promise someday. Chapter 12, verse 41, And abide in you forever. After spending a year in Chile, Jeffrey R. Holland shared the following insight concerning the word abide. Quote, Abide in me is an understandable and beautiful enough concept in the elegant English for the King James Bible. But abide is not a word we use much anymore. So I gained even more appreciation for this admonition from the Lord when I was introduced to the translation of this passage in another language. In Spanish, that familiar phrase is rendered, and I'm going to butcher this, permanecid in me, like the English verb abide, permanecer, means to remain, to stay. But even English speakers like me can hear the root cognate there of permanence. The sense of this then is stay, but stay forever. End of quote. Let's now go to Ether chapter 13. 
13 verses 1 through 12, the New Jerusalem. Ether 3 verse 1 through 12 describes what a great seer Ether was. Ether was shown many marvelous things by the Lord, including the establishment of a New Jerusalem prior to the second coming. Note what Ether said about the New Jerusalem. 1. It will be the holy sanctuary of the Lord. 2. It will be built upon the American continent for the remnant of the seed of Joseph. 3. It will be a holy city like the Jerusalem built unto the Lord. 4. It will stand until the earth is celestialized. 5. It will be a city for the pure and righteous. President Joseph Finley Smith wrote the following about the New Jerusalem, quote, The prevailing notion in the world is that this New Jerusalem is the city of Jerusalem, the ancient city of the Jews, which in the day of regeneration will be renewed. But this is not the case. We read in the book of Ether that the Lord revealed to him many of the same things which were seen by John. Ether, as members... As members of the church well know, was the last of the prophets among the Jaredites, and the Lord had revealed to him much history, uh, much concerning the history of the Jews in their city of Jerusalem, which stood in the days of the ministry of our Savior. In his vision, in many respects similar to that given by John, Ether saw the old city of Jerusalem and also the new city, which has not yet been built, and he wrote of them as follows, as reported in the writings of Moroni, Ether 13, 2 through 11. In the day of regeneration, when all things are made new, there will be three great cities that will be holy. One will be the Jerusalem of old, which shall be rebuilt according to the prophecy of Ezekiel. One will be the city of Zion, or of Enoch, which was taken from the earth when Enoch was translated, and which will be restored. And the city of Zion, or New Jerusalem, which is to be built upon the, by the seed of Joseph on this, the American continent. End of quote. Chapter 13, verse 3, the new Jerusalem which should come down out of heaven. The establishment of Zion and the new Jerusalem will come down out of heaven in both a literal and a symbolic way. In a symbolic way, the new Jerusalem will be built upon heavenly principles and under the influence of revelation to the Lord's chosen officers. In this way, it will come down from heaven and then mortals who are cleansed and purified to the tomb of Christ will build up a new city of holiness, even a new Jerusalem. There is, however, an additional meaning, a very literal meaning to this phrase. Enoch city, the city of holiness that was taken up into heaven, will come down from heaven and be united with the earthly new Jerusalem. What a glorious day that will be. Chapter 13, verse 9, there shall be a new heaven and a new earth. The Labrus Amakonki taught, this earth was created in a new or paradisiacal state. Then, incident to Adam's transgression, it fell to its present telestial state. At the second coming of our Lord, it will be renewed, regenerated, refreshed, transfigured, become again a new earth, a paradisiacal earth. Its millennial status will be a return to its pristine state of beauty and glory, the state that existed before the fall. This same designation applies to the celestial heaven and earth that will prevail in the day when the Father and Son make this planet their habitation. Chapter 13, verse 10. Blessed are they who dwell therein, for it is they whose garments are white through the blood of the Lamb. Citizenship in the New Jerusalem is attained only through the sanctification that comes from accepting the Lord Jesus Christ through faith, repentance, ordinances of salvation, receiving the Holy Ghost, and continued diligence and endurance. These inhabitants of the New Jerusalem are those who have been true and faithful to their covenants and birthright in the house of Israel through the lineage of Joseph. Chapter 13, verse 11, Then also cometh the Jerusalem of old. Ether prophesied of the millennial day when old Jerusalem will become again a holy city inhabited by Jews who have not only been gathered to their promised land from the four quarters of the earth, but also have accepted Jesus and his only true and living church and have been cleansed by faith in the atonement and faithfulness to the gospel ordinances and commandments. The temple will play a significant role in creating a sanctified and holy place and thereby making Jerusalem a holy city. Jerusalem shall rise again, wrote Elder Bruce R. McConkie. 
As she fell from grace because she forsook the living God, she will rise again when she once more worships her eternal king in the beauty of holiness. As she fell because of iniquity, so she shall be restored through righteousness. When the Jews receive the fullness of the everlasting gospel as it has been restored to the prophet Joseph Smith, they will return to Jerusalem as the Lord's true legal administrators to build up Jerusalem as a Zion and to and to place again on the ancient site, the temple of the new kingdom. And then when the Lord comes, the ancient city will shine forth with a glory and a splendor never before known among mortals. Did you catch that? Elmer McConkie prophesies that the temple in old Jerusalem will be built upon the ancient site of the temple where the temple during Christ's day was. But this will only be after the Jews have accepted the gospel. The Jews gathering to Israel right now is not a part of this. They have not accepted Christ. We are still waiting for this prophecy to be fulfilled by Ether. That after the Jews come into the true church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, then they will build a new city in old Jerusalem. Chapter 13, verses 51 through 31, Coriantumr. As battles raged and secret combinations extended among the people, Ether was commanded to call Coriantumr to repentance and prophesy about him. In these verses, we see inspired utterances not only on the fate of Coriantumr, but also on his entire people. If he and they would not repent, the entire Jairite nation would be destroyed, and Coriantumr would survive to witness the fulfillment of these prophecies and to see other and other people receive the land as an inheritance. Note that despite the Jaredites' past wickedness and hardness of heart, Ether's prophecy prophecies of doom and destruction were conditional. Such terrible bloodshed and sufferings could be averted if they would but repent unto the Lord. Coriantumr had devoted a great deal of time to studying all the arts of war and all the cunning of the world, yet he rejected the simple message of Ether, which would have brought him peace in a way that all his military skills could not. Know that the prophet Ether promised Coriantum and Ether 13 20 through 21, as well as fulfillment. Ether chapter 14. 14 verses 1 through 2. There began to be a great curse upon all the land. As a result of the wickedness and that prevailed among the Jaredites and their lack of, lack of consciousness and concern, the earth became cursed and whatever was left unattained was stolen. This caused people to become more vigilant as to their possessions and unwilling to lend or to borrow. This curse of the land that caused things to become slippery is similar to the conditions created by secret combination in Nephite times, such as the Gadianton bands. We will probably see the same repeated in our day, where things become slippery, where we will see law, lawlessness in the land. We are seeing that today. There is a lot of lawlessness in the land today. Chapter 14, verses 3 through 31. The remainder of the chapter recounts the ferocious battles that raged between Coriantum and the rebels who sought to overthrow him and who were supported in their rebellion by secret combinations. Terrible bloodshed enveloped the land, and the sights and scents of death permeated the entire area. Perhaps millions of Jaredite men, women, and children were slaughtered in these battles, and their bodies covered the landscape. It was impossible for any inhabitants to escape the horrors of these words. Such is the consequences of unrighteousness, brothers and sisters. That is the consequences. The judgments of God will come. Destruction follows wickedness. Book of Ether is clear on that point. Chapter 14, verse 25. The Lord did visit them in their fierceness of his wrath. These painful consequences of war were the direct result of their own wickedness, which in turn, which in turn produced a literal fulfillment of earlier prophecies, wherein the Lord had promised peace and protection to the inhabitants of the land if they would obey him, and destruction if they would not. It is clear from Moroni's statement that the wrath of God was poured upon the Jaredite civilization as a natural consequence of their own wickedness. Much, if not all, of the pain and suffering that could be viewed as the wrath of God came by means of the meanness, the cruelty, and the thirst for blood that filled the hearts of the spiritually sick and dead. So, brothers and sisters, God's wrath is poured out upon us because we choose wickedness. His wrath is not something he does just because he's angry and he's fuming. 
No, his wrath is the just result of wickedness. If we turn to wickedness, then the consequences is that his wrath be poured upon us and that destruction comes. God's anger is nothing more than the righteous use of justice. Justice says if you sin, there is a consequence. Destruction must follow if unrepented of. Let's now turn to Ether, chapter 15. Chapter 15, 1 through 3, he began to remember the words which Ether had spoken unto him. Amidst the horrors of the battle, Coriantumr is brought to the awful recognition that the prophecies of Ether concerning him and his people are literally being fulfilled. There is no salvation in merely recognizing the fulfillment of prophecy. Such recognition, however, may serve as a catalyst, as in the case of Coriantumr, to the recognition of other workings of God and as a spiritual waking of the soul that will lead one to call upon the Lord, be touched by the Spirit, and be led to repentance. This certainly was the case with Coriantumr. As he pondered on the words of the prophets, he was brought to the disconsolate state of knowing that he and his people had perhaps gone beyond the point of return and were left without hope for success. Chapter 15, verse 11, the hill Ramah. Moroni notes that this hill, which was a sacred site to him, was the same Camorra where his father Mormon had deposited the sacred plates. We do not know whether this hill had any significance to the Jaredites, but it may not be totally unreasonable to suggest that Ether, under the inspiration of the Lord, may have likewise secreted his plates away there in a similar manner as did Moroni. Chapter 15, verse 15, women and children being armed with weapons of war. In preparation for battle, all Jaredites, even women and children, were equipped with armor and armed with weapons of war. One can scarcely imagine such a war, where every person, young and old, man and woman, or child, is compelled to fight for his or her very life. This verse gives us a glimpse of the horrors of war, of total annihilation, again, because of wickedness, disobedience. 15 verse 16 through 17, when we understand that even little children nursing mothers along with all others engaged in bloody hand-to-hand -hand combat, we do not wonder why Ether recorded that at the end of each day, warning, their howling and lamentations did rent the air exceedingly. This poignant graphic image shows not only mourning for the death of young, strong soldiers, but also anguished cries of pain and suffering for the inhumane destruction of entire families. Ether 15 verse 19 Satan has fully Satan had full power over the hearts of the people as a result of their gross wickedness and their bloodthirstiness and warnings and warring nature the spirit of the lord no longer could influence them to righteousness thus their hearts were hardened and their minds were blinded they had become like mormon's people dead of workings to the spirit in this spiritual desensitized condition they became bound by the chains of their own sinfulness and the day of grace had passed for them Chapter 15, verse 22, they were drunken with anger. Just as a person who is inebriated with alcohol suffers from dull senses and slowed reactions, so also does a person whose intense anger produces an emotional intoxication and, hand, and hence irrational thinking and actions. Because anger and contention are the devil, the clear thinking that comes from the guidance of the Spirit disappears with the when these prevail. Compares Compassion and consideration for others is swallowed up by selfishness and self-indulgence. Coranthemer's people were filled with hatred and anger that they were as much out of control and frenzies as if they were physically under the influence of drugs or alcohol. Chapter 15, verse 32, Coranthemer fell to the earth and became as he if he had no life. Coriantumr did not die as a result of his wounds and his battle with Shiz, but survived via witness of the destruction of his people, just as prophesied by Ether, and to see another group of people inherit the land of, prophet, of promise. Again, just as prophesied by Ether, all of God's prophecies will be fulfilled, brothers and sisters. Chapter 15, 33-34, with the total demise of the Jaredite civilization, Ether was commanded to complete his record and hide it up in such a way as to be found by a future people. Moroni recorded that his abridgment of Ether's account was not a hundredth part of the record's totality. With his mission complete, Ether ended his record, not knowing whether he would be trenched by the power of God or would tarry until death upon the earth.
The Book of Mormon does not tell which of these fates befell him, but to him it did not matter because he had at least a firm hope of eternal life and very likely had received the more sure word of prophecy. Thank you for watching, brothers and sisters. Hopefully this helped with these chapters in Ether. If it did, please hit the like button.